This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. This is episode number 16, or should we say step number 16 on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And when I say beautiful, folks, I mean beautiful. If you haven't already, jump on over to Instagram and check out the picture that I posted there uh, yesterday. And yesterday would have been the 8th of February of 2020. And uh, just take a look at the beautiful picture I posted of the sunset over uh, our pigs. It's absolutely breathtaking. I also posted it to our Facebook site. So if you want to check it out there, Uh, as well. It's on our Facebook page, um, the Homestead Journey podcast uh, on both Facebook and Instagram. But absolutely beautiful, folks. We had a a snowstorm here this week. Uh, Actually, on Friday, it was kind of a snow slash ice slash snowstorm. So we got about three and a half inches of snow, followed by about a quarter of an inch of ice, followed by about another four and a half inches of snow, and everything just absolutely looks gorgeous. The ice on the trees with the snow on the ice is just breathtaking. Um, unfortunately, the ice on the trees and the snow on the trees has caused uh, trees to come down, limbs to come down. We've had power outages. Um, we actually were one of the lucky ones. Our power was out only for about an hour and a half on Friday, maybe two hours. Um, We have friends that were out 12 hours, uh, some a couple of days, some still don't have full power restored. And uh, so while it is beautiful out there, um, it is also causing some problems. And in fact, right now, I don't have any internet access here at the house. Um, It's knocked out uh, our cable uh, internet access, so I'm not sure when I'll actually be able to get this uploaded unless I get kind of crazy and fancy and somehow get it transferred to my phone, which I've never done before, and then uh, kind of go from uh, there and get it uh, uploaded. But anyhow, beautiful upstate New York and winter is here. Um, it was It's just been a bizarre year, folks. We had a, a, a snowy November into December and then it warmed up in January to the point where we had a lot of uh, bare ground and it was kind of like mud season. And now, boom, here in early February, we are actually getting real winter. And in fact, it was down to like four degrees above zero uh, here on the homestead today. So everything's frozen up, but still beautiful. Anyhow, uh, another weather report from upstate New York, I guess. Other uh, exciting things that happened this week, we passed... Uh, 2,000 downloads of this podcast this week. And so thank you so much for um, being a part of this journey and listening to me ramble on about homesteading. I really appreciate the fact that you're here. And if you're enjoying this podcast, if you could do me a huge favor, do two things. First of all, if you could pop over to iTunes or your favorite podcast platform of choice and leave me a review or a thumbs up, whatever they allow, that's going to help other people discover this podcast. But then if you could also share it with other people that you think might benefit from the Homestead Journey podcast, I would really, really appreciate it. But thank you so much for being part of uh, us getting to that 2000 download Mark, I am I'm honored, humbled, and uh, just thankful that there are people who want to hear me talk about homesteading. Let's jump on over to this episode's homestead happenings. So again, this week on the homestead, big snowstorm on Friday. And uh, so I actually ended up coming home early from my day job. I was home for lunch. I come home from about noon to one every day. And at about a quarter after, a friend of mine from work called me and said, don't bother coming back. They are closing the office at 1230. So I actually had um, an extra half of day on Friday and actually Friday evening as well, because usually on Friday evenings, this time of the year, 
uh, I am teaching snowboarding lessons, but uh, I had Friday evening free as well. And so I was actually able to spend the afternoon and the evening uh, catching up on some homestead reading that uh, I'm just absolutely enjoying. And uh, so other things that have taken place this week on the homestead after last weekend's marathon session at work, I was able to get my seed catalog or, or my seeds cataloged, inventoried. And then this week I spent quite a bit of time going through and thinking about what I'm going to order through the mail and uh, the seeds that we're going to plant this year in the garden. So kind of formulating my strategy with regards to the garden, talking with my wife and son about the things that they want to see planted, things maybe they don't care about. Uh, and so really as a family trying to come up with a game plan for uh, the homestead for 2020. Um, as usual, the bulk of my seed order will be going to Fedco Seeds. Uh, I absolutely like love that company. I've been very, very happy with them, a very happy customer. Uh, I'll be ordering um, some from Row 7 Seeds. I really enjoyed some of their offerings last year. It was my, my first time ordering from them last year and enjoyed most of what I ordered. Not everything. Um, the peas, the snow peas they had were very pretty, not very tasty. And uh, so I'm probably not going to order those. But uh, the rest of everything that I ordered last year I was pretty happy with. So I'm going to be ordering some more of that. Um, I'll be ordering a couple of things from Baker's Creek, but I only order from Baker's Creek what I can't find elsewhere. And it's not because I'm anti-Baker's Creek. It's just simply because I have found them to be um, quite a bit more expensive than uh, other uh, other seed companies. And in fact, if you go to our YouTube channel and look several years ago, well, was, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, I put together a, a spreadsheet where I did a, an analysis of the um, costs of buying seeds from them versus Fedco versus a whole bunch of other uh, companies and uh, just came to find out that they are just way, way more expensive. And you can factor in all of the free shipping you want. They are still way more expensive, um, not even close. Uh, and again, not banging on Baker's Creek, folks. If you love Baker's Creek and you're happy with what you're paying and, and what you're getting, you just go right ahead and do that. Um, but for me, I only order from them what I cannot find somewhere else. I'm also going to be placing an order, I think, with a new company that I just discovered a couple of days ago, and that's call, it's, it's called littleshopofseeds.com. And so if you go check them out, I'm not affiliated with any of these seed companies, by the way, um, but I'm going to place an order with them and just see how well I do. Their, their seeds are really, really cheap, and it just makes me wonder, is it too good to be true. Um, I'll also be placing, I think, a small order with MI Gardener as well. But uh, again, the bulk of my seeds, Fedco, and very excited about um, that. So that was a big part of my week this week. The other thing this week that we did is my son and I sat down and we have decided on the breeds of chicken that we're going to order this year for our homestead. And uh, we're going to be ordering through our local, the bulk of our chickens we're going to be ordering this year through our local feed store. Um, but I do have some surprises, some things coming up that we're going to actually talk about later on in this episode with regards to chickens. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. But uh, it's always a lot of fun for me to sit down and talk chickens with Brian J. And uh, in fact... We have something very, very special coming up where I am going to actually interview him for this podcast, and we're going to talk about the seven breeds of chickens that we're ordering, what we look for in a breed, um, why we're trying some of the different ones, why some of the ones that we maybe have tried in the past we haven't kept around. Um, there are three breeds uh, right now that we are, pretty much every year we are going to order some of those breeds. So we're going to talk about all of that in a future episode, but that's something else that took place here on the homestead as well. Along with the uh, power outage on Friday, I also discovered something else about our homestead I think that we need to address, and that is that our emergency preparedness plan is not really up to snuff. Um, we did not have any water stored up uh, when the power went out. Um, we had to kind of scramble to find flashlights and batteries and candles. Um, so we need to do a little bit better uh, putting together an emergency preparedness kit of some sort. 
um, and having a little bit better plan. Because I was thinking if we had several uh, days without power here, and it really was looking like that might be the case, uh, we have animals that need to be watered. Um, and if I can't, if I, if I can't pump water from my well, then what am I going to do now for a heat source? We're very, we're very lucky in that, uh, I shouldn't say lucky, very blessed. I guess a friend of ours that moved to Texas a couple of years ago, uh, gave us his kerosene heater. And so we have that as far as a heat source, but, um, you know, not having the water was a bit concerning. And now we could bring in snow and melt it on top of the heater. So there's things we could do. But I definitely want to think through a little bit better our emergency preparedness. Now, obviously, yes, we could go out and buy a generator. And maybe we should and maybe we will. I don't know. But in the over 10 years that we have been on this property, we really have not had that many power outages. Now, I'm going to knock on some wood here. Um, but we really have been very blessed with that in that regard. And so I, I'm not quite sure that we need to run out and buy a generator, but maybe we need to think about that, especially considering the fact that we have the animals that uh, need to be cared for. Otherwise on the homestead, it was relatively quiet. The animals uh, seem to be doing okay with the cold. When it does get down to these super, super cold temps, it is a bit of a pain in the butt because we are having to haul water more frequently. And we were a bit spoiled in January not having to do that. But that's just part of living in the great state of New York in the wintertime. Um, you, you just have to put up with that and deal with it. And uh, in the next several years, hopefully we'll put in place maybe a little bit better infrastructure, maybe some frost-free hydrants if we can uh, conjure up the money to do that. Um, but that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead this week. All right, it is time for this episode's Charting the Course segment. Now, on this episode, we are going to be starting a multi-part series with regards to raising chickens. Now, for many people, when they think of a homestead, the first animal they associate with homesteading is the chicken. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every homestead has to have chickens. Please don't get me wrong. But I think for a lot of people, for many, many homesteads, the place that they start raising livestock is going to be the chicken. And in fact, for some people, it is getting chickens that kind of leads them into the homesteading lifestyles. People jokingly refer to chickens as the gateway animal to farming. And <clears throat> I think in many instances, that probably is true. So as we think about chickens and we talk about raising chickens, there's a couple of things that I do want to say right from the get-go. As always, I do not claim to be an expert in anything. But if there is one area where I do think I have a little bit of knowledge, it is in the area of chickens. We've been raising chickens now for about 13 years. Uh, we raised them for about five years at my grandfather's house, which is about a quarter of a mile from here. And then we brought them onto our homestead in 2013, and we've had them here since then. And during the last 13 years, we have raised a lot of different breeds of chickens. We have applied uh, a number of different approaches to raising chickens, whether we ordered them through the mail, we bought them um, at the local feed store, we actually had chickens hatch, uh, set and hatch out our own. We've done mixed breed flocks. We've done single breed flocks. We have raised standard breed birds for meat birds. We've raised Cornish cross for meat birds. We have really done a lot with chickens over the last 13 years. And so, well, again, I don't claim to be an expert. <laughs> I do feel like I do have a little bit of knowledge that I can share with people that will hopefully uh, be helpful and will help you as you are either evaluating whether or not to get chickens evaluating what kinds of chickens to get, uh, how to get them. Hopefully this series will be helpful to you. And I think this is going to be a series that is going to be valuable, not just to people who are brand new to raising chickens, but I, my goal, my hope is that if you've been raising chickens for a while, there'll be some nuggets uh, that I will offer up that will help you as well. And if there's something that you disagree with, if there's something that you think I've gotten wrong, please let me know. 
uh, send me an email to the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or you can contact us on our social media sites. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. The links are in the show notes. And if you're watching this via our YouTube channel, uh, reply in the comments and uh, let me know if you think I've gotten something wrong um, or there's maybe a, an approach that I should have thought about and I didn't. I definitely will be glad to offer any corrections as necessary and uh, to maybe discuss some of those things that you might want to hear about. And in fact, because we are starting a multi-part series, if there are some questions that you have, let me know what they are. If there's some things that you would like to have answered, I will be glad to do that. But let's just jump in right at kind of the beginning. As we think about getting chickens, what do chickens need? Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing the best possible situation for our animals. Now, we're never going to achieve perfection. No matter how good of intentions we have, things happen, life happens, chickens get sick, uh, predators, you know, break through our best defenses. Um, as I, I shared with you before, my, my buddy Dave says, if you have livestock, eventually you're going to have dead stock. And uh, that holds true with regards to chickens as well. But certainly we want to do our best to meet the needs of our chickens so that they can have the best opportunity, not just to survive, but to thrive. So in my opinion, there's really four things that chickens need. The first thing that they need is they need a coop that is draft free and offer some level of predator protection. Now, when I say that the coop needs to be draft free, I'm not saying that it needs to be airtight. I'm not saying that it needs to be weather tight. And in fact, I think sometimes people try to do that with their chicken coops and that's, well, it's, it's really bad in essence for your chickens. You see, chickens do not urinate. Chickens relieve themselves of excess moisture through their feces, through their poop, and through their respiration. And so if you have an airtight coop and these birds are, you know, they're relieving themselves into either the air through the respiration or through their feces, that's creating a damp environment. And if it's airtight, an airtight coop, and then you add a heat lamp like some people have a tendency to do, now what you've just created is a chicken sauna. You've created an environment where it's, it's very ripe for pathogens to develop and also for frostbite to develop on the combs of your animals. And uh, so you want to have good ventilation so that that moisture from their, air, from their breathing can be released. Now, if you look at pictures of our coop, and uh, we have plenty of pictures on our Facebook pages, um, I also have a page dedicated if you go to backyardchickens.com and look up, I think it's under BL Wells 45, but if you just search there for a woods open air chicken coop, you will see pictures of our chicken coop build. And in fact, I'll link to that in the show notes. The front of our coop is open to the elements all of the time. It doesn't matter whether it's 100 degrees or it's 10 degrees below zero, I never close that off. Um, it's just, it's a couple of windows with hardware cloth. Uh, and what that does is it allows for good airflow. But the secret is that the back of the coop is draft free. It's very, very solid. And so the wind can't whip through that coop. Uh, and so the birds can get in out of the elements um, and they can kind of huddle together to generate warmth but there's no breeze blowing through the coop. So they need a coop that is draft free. And that's why certain coop designs that I see, in particular mobile coops that I see, well, they might work in Southern climates and they might work in Northern climates during the summer. They're not going to be good um, options, at least in my opinion, when it comes to the colder months, um, especially when you're talking about temperatures that are in in or around the freezing uh, range. Um, they're not going to be good for chickens because of the draft that's going to create uh, a condition that's not going to be good for them. The second thing that the coop needs is to provide some level of predator protection. 
And that's going to vary depending on where you live. If you have a lot of aerial predators, hawks, owls, and those kinds of things, then you may need to put in netting and, and things like that. If you have a lot of uh, coyotes or if you have raccoons, skunks, mink, weasels, your, the way that you approach predator protection may vary a little bit, but you certainly are going to want to offer your birds some area where they can run to or run under uh, if there's a, a hawk overhead uh, in a place at night where you can close them in and they can be protected from nighttime predators. The second thing that your chickens need is your chickens are going to need a quality feed. Now some people are trying to feed their chickens on scraps and on um, grass and, and those kinds of things and you can do that to a certain extent. But I do think that if you want to maximize your egg production and if you're raising meat birds you want to maximize the growth of your birds then you are going to need to provide them with a good quality feed. Uh, now you can manufacture or mix together your own feed and there are a lot of recipes uh, online for those kinds of things but you definitely want to provide your chickens with a well-balanced nutritional diet in order to maximize again the growth of the chicken for meat and the production of eggs. Um, now in my opinion whether or not it's organic, non-GMO, conventional, um, all of those kinds of things, that's going to be up to each individual homestead or each individual homesteading family. And some of that may be driven by what's available in your area. You know, my opinion is very much the same of Jason Smith over at Cog Hill Farm, and that is to do the best you can with what you got. Uh, and so we here on 3B Farm and Homestead have chosen to buy from a local feed mill. It's feed that is more conventional. It's not non-GMO. It's not organic. But I know the farmer. He's grown a lot of the grain. And so I would much rather support a local guy uh, personally than invest in um, an organic non-GMO label that I don't necessarily trust. But anyhow, your chickens are going to need a good quality feed. The third thing that your chickens are going to need, besides the coop, the draft-free and predator protection that's afforded by the coop and the good feed, is your chickens are going to need clean water. Now here in the Northeast, during the winter times, that for us sometimes is a bit of a struggle. We have not found a heated waterer that we like. We've tried a number of different things in our coops. And we right now offer our chickens water by swapping out waterers a couple times a day. And that has worked for us, but not as well as I would like. I would really like to find a heated waterer uh, that would provide them with access to uh, clean water all of the time with no worry of it freezing. But up to this point, we have not discovered that waterer. Now... Um, I did see a review on a, on a waterer on another channel, the Mindful Homesteads channel, um, and it's a waterer that I may go ahead and purchase and see how well it works for us. Um, but up to this point, the waterers that we have had, I just for one reason or another, have not been designs that I have liked. But your chickens are going to need clean water, and so you need to figure out how to make sure that that happens. Now, during the summertime, I have built a system using a 55-gallon drum that goes to some waterers that offers them a continuous, continuous access to uh, a supply of water. And in fact, I'm going to be improving upon that by add or adding guttering to uh, the side of the coop that will then, when it rains, provide a refresh in those barrels uh, that then feeds that system. Um, but definitely making sure that your chickens have water is a very important thing because the if you don't give them access to good water, it's going to affect their meat production, it's going to, um, not sorry, it's going to affect their egg production, it's going to affect their growth rates, and it can affect their overall general health and well-being, and we certainly don't want that. So not only do your chickens need a draft-free coop and with predator protection, not only do they need feed and water, <clears throat> the last thing that they need is they need room. 
And what I mean by that is your chickens, the, the number of chickens that you're going to be able to keep is going to be dictated by the amount of area that you have to dedicate to those chickens. Um, and you, you want to be careful that you don't overcrowd your chickens. If you try to get too many chickens and, and too little of a space, then you can end up with your chickens becoming cannibals. Uh, they will start pecking each other. They will start, um, in essence, eating each other. And uh, you definitely don't want that. Now, the amount of room that each chicken is going to need is going to vary slightly based on the size of the bird as well as the system in which you are keeping those birds. But the general rule of thumb is that a chicken is going to need two to three square feet of indoor coop space and about 10 square feet of outdoor space in a run of some sort. Now, if you are keeping your chickens in a chicken tractor or if you are um, allowing them to free range, this is going to maybe be a little bit of a, a little bit different. But if you're keeping your chickens in a fixed coop with a run, generally speaking, it's two to three square feet per bird and about 10 to 15 square feet per bird in the outside run. So you just need to keep that in mind. So we've talked about what chickens need, right? The draft free coop, the feed, the water, and the room. So now that we've kind of answered the question, what do chickens need? Let's try to answer the question, how should we raise our chickens? There are a number of different systems in which you can raise or that you can use to raise chickens. And I think they all have their advantages and their drawbacks. And I don't think any chicken system, quite frankly, is a perfect chicken raising system. I just don't think there is because I think what works on one homestead isn't necessarily going to work on another. So for example, the grass fed kind of approach that Polyface Farm uses, Joel Salatin's farm, uh, where they have those mobile chicken coops that they are moving across vast pastures of land, looks great on paper. But for most homesteaders, we don't have huge pastures like that. That's never going to work where I'm at. I don't have access to a pasture type system like that. So does that mean that I cannot raise chickens? No. That just means that that, well, it's a great system for, for Joel Salatin. That's not a system that's going to work for me. So I need to look and see what other options are out there. So. As I've thought about it, I think there's really four major ways that you can raise chickens. The first way is to free range. Just allow the chickens to kind of go where they want, when they want. Um, and within reason, you usually would let them out uh, in the morning and they would come back to the coop and you would close them up at night. But during the day, they go where they want. Now, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, they are going to be eating mosquitoes and they're going to be eating uh, ticks and they're going to be uh, eating other um, pests uh, on your on your farm. Um, they're going to be foraging for a lot of their own diet. So your feed costs aren't going to be as great. They're going to be getting a lot of green and a lot of just variety in their diet. So the yolks are going to be a really, really awesome, uh, thick, almost a dark orange color, just very rich in flavor. Um, there's a lot of benefits to a free range chicken system, but there are a lot of drawbacks too. Uh, and the first and foremost being that chickens will find a way to poop anywhere and everywhere. They will poop in places that you didn't think it was possible for them to poop. They will poop there. And so if you don't mind stepping out of your front door into a freshly deposited chicken turd, then free ranging chickens might be for you. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like stepping in chicken poop. Um, and so I don't care for a free range system in part because of that. But another reason why free range chickens, at least I don't care for that model, is because free range chickens go where they will. And so they are going to turn whatever area they want into a dust bath, whether it's your prized rose bush or uh, garden, or it's your vegetable garden, or it's uh, wherever they're going to, maybe it's the front lawn, they're going to make a dust bath where they want to make a dust bath. Um, and not only that, but they are going to eat 
whatever they come in contact with. Um, they will eat your flower bed, they will eat your garden, they will mow through a row of fresh, freshly sprouted peas before you can blink an eye. Um, and so you're going, you are going to have to build fences to keep the chickens out, whether it's out of your vegetable garden, out of your flower garden. Um, you are going to ha spend your time chasing and shooing chickens out of areas where you don't want them. So then the next option that you have are pastured chickens. This is where you keep them in a mobile run of some sort. And so you have maybe electric poultry netting and you move it around and uh, you kind of can keep them in an area where maybe you want the ground worked and you want to turn that into a garden bed. Um, maybe you want some weeding done in a particular area. And so you will concentrate the chickens there. Or you can move them around um, a pasture whether it's inside a mobile chicken coop like a, a Joel Salatin style chicken tractor or a John Siskovich style chicken tractor and you can move them around um, your, your lawn, you can move them around a pasture and uh, that works well for some people. But there's downsides to that. A, there's labor involved. You've got to move them periodically or else they're going to just leave that as scorched earth. Um, and not only that, but you have to have the land or the, the pasture in which to be able to uh, provide a system like that. We tried that here several years ago, raising standard breed chickens. And I don't think my yard has ever fully recovered um, because I just did not have enough, enough ground um, whereby I could give the land enough rest before the chickens came back through. Now, it might have worked better if I was raising Cornish cross meat birds because they are not as destructive, uh, but with two chicken tractors filled with 25 standard breed roosters or cockerels, they worked a, a, a small ground over in, in less than half a day. And so unless I move them twice a day and sometimes three times a day, they were just really tearing things up. And not only that, but I didn't have enough area to whereby I would not come back to that ground again before it had recovered. So that's the downside to that model is that you have to have the land to be able to do that. So pastured and, and I, I guess I, I've kind of mixed pastured and keeping them in a tractor, a chicken tractor, because Pastured is you keep them in a mobile coop and put them into an area where they kind of run around So it's a little bit of a bigger area So you don't have to move the coop quite as often and the tractor They pretty much stay in the tractor and you're moving the tractor every day or every other day The final system then is a chicken run So this is kind of the traditional way of keeping chickens. It's a chicken coop with a run of some sort and that is the model that we have ended up adopting here on 3B Farm and Homestead. And that is that we have a, a fairly good sized chicken coop. It's uh, about eight by 16, I think. Um, and then we have an outside run that I don't know how many square feet it is, but I bought some temporary um, construction barrier and I've kind of put it up and um, it's a, a pretty good size run. And then in the winter, they have access to an outside run in a, um, a hoop coop that is eight by 12. So it's a small run, but it still gets them out of the coop and they still have access to the other uh, run if they want, um, just they don't like to get out in, so out in the snow. And um, so in the winter, they spend more time in the hoop coop, but they certainly have access to it. So your really your four options, in my opinion, are free range, pastured, tractor, and run, and each one of them have kind of benefits and drawbacks. Um, with regards to the run, obviously the drawback is that they're on the same ground all the time. And so you're constantly having to put either in straw or shavings or wood chips, we use wood chips, into the run to cut down on the, the, the noise, the, the, not the noise, the smell um, and the manure buildup. And then, you know, you kind of have to shovel it in and shovel it out. Um, where when you are moving them around in a chicken tractor or, or in a pastured poultry type operation, their manure is being deposited all over and you never have to move it. So there's a lot less labor um, from that regard in a pastured poultry 
or a chicken tractor type operation um, than there is in a chicken run. So now that we have talked about what a chicken needs and we've talked about various chicken systems in which we can raise chickens, let's end this segment by answering the question, where should I get chickens? Now you can order chickens through the mail. There are a lot of hatcheries, Mount Healthy Hatchery, Murray McMurray Hatchery, Hoover's Hatchery, Ideal Hatchery. Um, there are just a lot of hatcheries, major hatcheries, where you can order chicks and they will ship them through the mail. You go down to your post office, you pick them up, you bring them home, you put them in your brooder and you raise them that way. The downside to that is that you have to order a spit a minimum number of chicks and generally speaking it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 chicks. Sometimes it's a little bit less than that but generally speaking it's about 25 chicks and for some people they don't need 25 chicks. Some people can't, they don't have space for 25 chicks or their regulations where they live doesn't allow them to raise that many chickens. And so for some people ordering chickens through the mail that way is not an option. Now, if you have friends that are interested in getting chickens, then what you can do is you can all go in and, you know, order however many chickens and split them up when they come in. But for some people, just because of the number of chickens that are required, uh, it is not an option to do it that way. Another way that you can get chickens uh, is you can buy them at your local feed store. Uh, Tractor Supply generally has chick days, I think starting in March and at least our tractor supply seems to have them a good part of the summer and even in the fall for people that want to start them in the fall and raise them through the winter so that they will start uh, laying uh, eggs in the spring. Um, but if you get them in the spring, generally speaking, depending on the breed, they will start laying in the fall somewhere, depending on when, when you get them, somewhere in the September or October time frame is generally when ours have started laying. But you can get them through Tractor Supply. We have a local feed store, Country Power Products, where we traditionally have ordered ours, um, and so you can get them there. And when you go that route, now you can get them in smaller quantities. In New York State, by law, you have to order at least six chickens, or at least six chicks, um, but you can do it that way and get smaller quantities. The downside to ordering there or buying there is if you go to Tractor Supply, you're going to only have four or five breeds if you're lucky to choose from. Um, so your selection is not going to be as great as ordering them through uh, a hatchery directly. The nice thing about Country Power, our local feed store, is they have an order template where ahead of time you can actually specifically order the number of chicks you want of the particular breeds that you want. And so it kind of gives you that flexibility, um, but you're not tied to having to order a, spe a specific number of chicks other than the minimum of six. Another thing you can do is you can order them through, or you can buy them through Craigslist. So a lot of times there will be people who hatch chicks out um, in your local area and they will offer chicks for sale, or you can even buy pullets or you can buy started hens um, at that point and you can you can get them and bring them to your farm. Now the downside to that is in many cases if you're buying chicks that way people are going to sell them a straight run they're not going to sex those chickens uh, so you don't know if you're getting roosters or you're getting or you're getting cockerels which is a, a young male or you're getting pullets which is a young female um, and if you decide to order or to buy I should say uh, hens from somebody, you don't know what kind of diseases they have or how long they have been laying. So you may be buying hens that no longer are laying eggs. We call them spent hens. Um, and so you're going to be feeding this animal and getting very little uh, to no eggs from it. It may be only good for the stew pot. The final option you have is to order through a specialty breeder. And uh, sometimes you do that locally. Um, I have a friend uh, who is a specialty breeder. He has spent years and years and years. Uh, Butt Nugget Farms, if you want to look him up, I have no affiliation, get no 
credit whatsoever for this, but if you want to look him up, Butt Nugget Farms on Facebook, you can see the gorgeous chickens that he offers as well as the uh, colors of the uh, eggs that um, he has developed, the lines that he has developed over years. And uh, so you can buy through a specialty breeder. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be interviewing a specialty breeder from um, California. And I'm excited about that uh, interview. But uh, they have really focused on four or five different, well, it's more than that. I think it's probably 10 or 15 varieties. So it's not uh, the sheer variety that you would get through um, a Myers or a Murray McMurray but they have really focused either on the egg color or the coloring of the chicken itself uh, so the aesthetic of the bird and so you may want to buy from a specialty breeder now the downside to buying from a specialty breeder is generally speaking you're going to pay more per chick uh, or more per pullet for for those birds than you would from Murray McMurray. I mean, you may be spending 10, 15, 20, 25 dollars a chick if you buy from a specialty breeder instead of, you know, two or three or four bucks a chick if you're buying from Murray McMurray. Um, having said that, there are other things to consider. The hatchery that I'm going to be hopefully interviewing in uh, a couple of weeks is a hatchery that is very focused on the impact of uh, on the environment. They're also very um, aware of, you know, the, at a commercial hatchery, there's not a lot of call for roosters. So the, the males get called. Um, they may drown them, they may kill them live. And, you know, and, and so there are people who have a problem with that. It's something that I'm not very comfortable with, to be honest with you. Um, and so what this hatchery does is actually gives the males away to be raised as food. Uh, and so that's how they handle it. They're really a no-kill hatchery. The only thing that they would cull would be uh, chickens that are born with birth defects where they feel like that chicken is not going to be able to, to thrive. It's not just an aesthetic thing, but it's something where if the chicken is born in such a way, maybe it's, it's got a deformed leg or, or something like that, then they are going to cull it. Um, but other than that, just to cull it because it's a, a male instead of a female, they don't do that. So, but because of that, you spend a little bit more money for that. And so you just need to weigh what is priority to you? What are the things that are important to you? And we're going to talk about that with the hatchery here in a couple of weeks. But your options really are to order them through the mail, to order them through a feed store, to uh, get them off Craigslist uh, or to get them through a specialty breeder. And there are certainly pluses and minuses um, with, with any of those options. In my opinion, I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. I just think that you need to be very aware of your options. And especially if you're buying from Craigslist, you need to understand that you may be buying somebody else's problem. And it might be a sickly bird. It might be uh, a spent hen. Just keep that in mind. Now, as I've talked about acquiring chickens, I've been talking about buying chicks and buying pullets, which are live animals. You certainly can buy eggs and hatch them out yourself. Uh, well, I wouldn't say you hatch them out yourself. I think it'd be rather foolish for you to try to sit on eggs for 28 days. <laughs> but you can buy fertile eggs and have them shipped to you and put them in an incubator. Um, but that's something that, at least in my opinion, if you are new to chickens, that's something that you don't want to start out doing. That's just my opinion. I think there's enough of a learning curve to raising chickens that you're going to want to start out at a minimum with chicks, um, possibly with pullets. I don't know as I would necessarily recommend that you get hens right away because, again, you don't necessarily know what to look for. Um, but I would recommend you start with live animals just because there's a bit of a learning curve to hatching out eggs and you don't want to necessarily put that, at least in my opinion, on top of the learning curve of raising chickens themselves. So that is been a lot of information, a lot of ground for us to cover in this episode. So we're going to stop right there. But we have talked today about what chickens need. 
uh, the coops that they need, the room that they need, the feed and water that they need. We've talked about the chicken systems, the various options that you have from free range to pastured to tractors to runs. We've talked about the various ways that you can get chicks and chickens, whether it's through the mail, uh, through the feed store, Craigslist, or a specialty breeder. Next week, I am very, very excited to share with you uh, the next segment in this series, and that is going to be an interview I did with my son, Brian Jr., where we talk about some of the things that you might want to consider with regards to the breeds of chicken that you choose, the things that we have considered here on our homestead, and we are going to reveal the seven breeds of chicken, at least seven breeds, that we are going to raise here on 3B Farm and Homestead. You're definitely not going to want to miss that episode, folks. I think you're going to enjoy it. I had so much fun uh, recording that episode with my son, and I really think um, it's going to be a good time with some great information for you. So folks, that is it for this week's episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, if you could, jump on over to iTunes or your favorite podcast player and give us a review. Give us a thumbs up on some of the platforms they allow you to do that. Uh, if you haven't already, share it with some other folks, people that you think might enjoy or benefit from this. Um, as always, the music on this podcast is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them and a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, please keep up the good work.